Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another story in the life of the old time rock and roller. In today's session, we will begin in 1984. Now, if you recall Van Halen's 1984 album was a smash. Heavy rock was on the rise. Groups like Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Yngwie Malmsteen, they were traveling all around the country and there was a big serious rock revival in the Coliseums. So I will set the time machine to 1984 and this is where our story will begin. I had relocated to Richmond, Virginia and I was in a group called Yo Mama. Cheryl Tiller was the lead vocalist, Brian Patterson the rhythm guitar player, Bob Quarles, the physician, the pharmacist, played keyboard. And there were two really outstanding guys in the rhythm section, Mark Kaplan and Scott Murphy. Scott was only 18, but he had the double bass drum thing down and he could go like a hurricane. And Mark was like Jack Bruce on the bass. He was incredible. So our first job was at Virginia Commonwealth University. That went really well. And the next week we played a festival up in the Tappahannock area. That was cool too. But then Cheryl's husband got transferred to Florida and she announced, hey, I've got to leave the group. I'm leaving in two weeks, sorry. So Mark and Scott and I had hit it off really well and we decided to start an all original group. And we called it Valhalla. Valhalla in Norse mythology was the hall of the chosen slain. It was so large, it had doors that 500 men could walk side by side through. And Odin, the god of war, would have a big feast every night. And just at the end of the feast before dawn, all of those spirits that were in Valhalla, the warriors, they would be reincarnated back on the battlefield to fight another day. And the Valkyries were naked women on horseback that would fly around and observe the battle, check out the best warriors and choose them to go into the hall of the chosen slain. So they would be slain, go to Valhalla, be reincarnated and the cycle would start all over again. The nature of our songs were historical. We wrote Valhalla, the Berserkers, before, they, before the Vikings would go into battle. They'd get all painted up and they'd be really wild and crazy and people called them Berserk. So we wrote a trilogy called Valhalla, the Berserkers, and the Cry which was the aftermath on the battlefield as they were waiting to be pulled back up to Valhalla. The next song we wrote was The Submariner about a submarine captain and all of the machinations that go on in a sub during World War II. This was Mark's creation. It was beautiful. <laughs>
a vessel well into the night To attack the ship with exact precision They'll have to wait until the time is right Dive down in the water Sculpting the ship within his sight Then he gives the order for the torpedoes to strike He commands the battle station, it's time for us to use our naval might The gunnery officer takes position, the crew and all aboard prepare to fight Dive down in the water, scoping the ship within his sight the guys called Ride, 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 which was about a Civil War battle that I had read about. So get on your horse and ride, 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 ride. The guys will be all on your side. We have to fight with tickets here. After the first seven or eight songs, we realized we might be the first rock band to go on PBS as a historical rock band. So every week would practice maybe three times a week. We'd start off with a jam session and then we'd bring whatever new ideas we had to the table and work on what we had from the previous weeks. This was not going to be enough to sustain me. So I looked around and I joined a band called the First Class Band. They were the number one money-making band for a booking agent called East Coast Entertainment. And we never did a, a job for less than 1300 to 2300 So I was making decent money, 350 375 on the weekend, and that afforded me the luxury of being able to be in Valhalla and continue the all original pursuit. Now, let me tell you, Mark and Scott were such good players. This was really challenging. My chops got to a level that they had never been to before. And every week was more and more challenging. I'm gonna play you some of these songs as we go because they're really terrific and I want you to get a flavor of the band. In the meantime, a couple of years went by and it was my partner's birthday and I knew she wanted this $1,200 fold-out postal desk. It was really beautiful. So I bought it for her and got Scott the drummer who had a pickup to help me bring it over to the house. Well, when we pulled into the driveway, my partner had gotten into a jealous rage and torn up all of the photographs I had of me playing live at the whiskey with Kathy McDonald and Leah Santos and other people. And then she was frothing at the mouth and she came out and had my Martin D28 and she smashed it in the, in the driveway into pieces and then went into the house. Well, Scott looked at me and he said, well, does the desk stay or, or go? Are we still taking it in the house or are you taking it back to the store? I took it in the house. So 
we continued playing along. The first class band went along great. And we had an opportunity. I met a guy who used to be in a band with Billy Squire, who did The Stroke. And this band was called The Mad Hatter. And Rick Grimaldi was his name. And he had a contact, a direct line to John Bon Jovi's Uncle Tony. And he sent him our demo tapes and a couple of bottles of wine to see if he could secure an audition. Well, in the meantime, there was a local studio in town called The Flood Zone. Had a couple of owners and a guitar player, singer, producer named Bruce Olson was one of the owners. So we invited Bruce out to one of our rehearsals to see if we could get some spec time at his studio and maybe have him produce us. So we played our show for him and we sat down in a little Q&A session after. And maybe the second question out of his mouth was, now suppose I wanted you guys to record naked. What would you, what would you feel about that? Would that be cool? And we all kind of looked at each other and said, where's this guy coming from? But we, you know, we got over it and we said, you know, possibly under the right circumstance if you gave us a really valid reason. Um, so it ended up, he let us use the studio. We, we had to pay for an engineer, a guy named Carl, cool engineer, had green sunglasses that were really neat. And we paid for the tape. So we recorded all day long, recorded probably 20, 22 songs we had written to that point. I also had my four track TIAC and we did a separate recording session where we recorded some new originals and that was what Rick Grimaldi used to send to Tony Bon Jovi. Well, we had been rehearsing, writing for about seven years at this point. And we were really, really good. And Rick called me up and he said, I got you the showcase. It's gonna be at the power station in Manhattan. And the power station was Tony Bon Jovi's recording studio and he was putting all of the big stars through there. So it was going great. The audition was set up for the weekend of Yom Kippur. And he was gonna have TV there. He was gonna film and record the whole thing. He had commitments from four major record labels. So, you know, we were flying high. We thought this was it. Kept practicing in the meantime. I think we went to the Coliseum and saw uh, Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and Ingve Malmsteen. And Ingve shredded them all. He was just incredible. Although he played everything he knew in the first three minutes, but he was still the first guitar player I had seen since Jimi Hendrix and Eddie that had done something different with the guitar, and I respected that a lot. So we get up to maybe two weeks before the showcase, and Mark called me up and he said, I can't do the showcase. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know I'm, I'm Jewish, right? Well, that's the beginning of Yom Kippur, and it's six o'clock on Friday, I can't play any kind of music throughout the whole weekend, it's a Sabbath. And we were due to go on at nine o'clock. All the years we had been together, he had never been to the temple or talked about this or anything, but all of a sudden, it came up. And I talked till I was blue in the face and had the worst headache of my life. But it resulted in, I had to call Rick and cancel the showcase. Tony Bon Jovi was furious. Rick was furious. Scott and I were furious. But we had been through so much, um, 
We said, all right, let's keep going. Well, in Richmond, Virginia, they have an annual folk festival, but it has everything. It has folk, it has blues, it has gospel, it has rock and so forth. And I met a lady and I sent her the tape and she said, wow, I love this. She said, unfortunately, the deadline for the festival closed a week ago Friday. But if you send it in next year, and remind me, then you're on the big show for sure. So Mark felt a little bad about us missing the showcase. And he said, I'll take care of it. So we decided to change the name of the band to Believer. And we had some new pictures taken up and Mark said, I'll, I'll do the tape. I'll make sure the press kit is right and everything. Well, the deadline came and went. I didn't hear from the lady. We weren't on the festival. I called her up and said, what happened? Well, we sent it in weeks ago. You said we'd be on the show. She said, well, I never got it. Uh, and then she looked and looked and she found the Believer package and said, oh, I didn't know this was you guys. I just tossed it over here. So that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back at that point. Um, we, we were up to playing for about nine years at that point, um, but decided to take a break. So I moved to Atlanta because I wanted to get in on some big time action down there. Well, that would not be the end of Valhalla. In 1996, I started my record company and put out I Need You, and the following year I put out Forest on Fire. And the next year I thought, I'm totally ready to switch into blues from here on out, but I want to get a good recording of the Valhalla guys. So I called Mark and Scott, they were all up for it. I flew them down and I called my buddy Raymond Victor to handle the lead singing. Oh, Ray flew out from California we rehearsed for a week. We went in and we recorded. And Ray was a great singer, but his voice didn't really suit the style of the songs. So I think our earlier tapes from a vocal perspective, even though Mark was singing and he wasn't a hundred percent there, it was more representational, but I'll play you some of these songs. And we had a, an incredible week rehearsing and laughing and recording. And we ended it up uh, playing a gig at a, a theater in Marietta on the square. And we had a limo pick us up and Mary Roby, who started the website Mary for Music and won the Keeping the Blues Alive Award, had started working for my record company. And so she came down for the event and we were all in the limo and the show was great. I've got a video of it, but the sound didn't come out for some reason. I'm going to work with that. The project was exhilarating and we had recorded probably only a third of the songs when we were in Georgia and our early songs at that. But some of them were quite good. I hope you'll be the judge of that. You let me know if you like it. But it was an amazing, almost a decade of really hard rock, tremendous writing and very intense music. It was a great time, really. We should have, if we had the right front singer and the showcase wasn't on Yom Kippur, I think Valhalla would have gone to the top. And as it is, once we did make the record and I called it Under the Gun, it became a big cult hit in England. And Kind of like The Clash came out 
we were and still are the Valhalla band has a a very big sort of underground following over there but at any rate music was great it was still sex drugs and rock and roll people weren't focused on the TV and on the news and all this crap that's going on now people just wanted to hear music have a good time go out and party and let the good times roll and that's what we do on these videos so I appreciate you coming along for this short story it'll be longer once I add the music I know but all I can say is keep loving your heart a song in your head and I will see you down the story highway on the next adventure of the old time rock and roller so long my friends see you next time It's love.